Hello, coming to you from the pleasant city of board gaming, Omaha, Nebraska. Welcome to the Out of the Dust podcast. I'm your host, Never Cut Your Route Off Bryce. Tied in with the popular recurring Out of the Dust Geek list on Board Game Geek. The Out of the Dust podcast is a weekly podcast that is focused on re-exploring games we play that we hadn't previously played in a year or more. Why did the game get dusty? Why did you decide to dust it off? How does the game compare to how you remembered it? Are you likely to play it more often in the future? These are the questions that we're interested in examining on Out of the Dust. This week on the podcast, episode 45 on the Out of the Dust segment, I'll bring Euphoria Out of the Dust, and a contributor will dust off Caverna. On the reaction segment, I discuss cultural education and board game design. On the What I've Been Playing segment, I review Bricks. On the Obscure Bryce Game segment, I review Banana Split. And we wrap up the episode by counting down to my number four table hog game. I had a chance to bring Euphoria, Build a Better Dystopia, out of the dust recently. Designed by Jimmy Stegmeier and Alan Stone and published by Stonemeyer Games, Euphoria is yet another hit from the killer year of board games 2013. This was one of my more memorable Gen Con Live auction wins as I won one of the treasured Kickstarter Deluxe Editions for 40 bucks. I last played Euphoria two years and one month ago. Euphoria is a favorite of my wife, so I'm surprised this one got so dusty. We brought it out of the dust to try out the new expansion, which adds a ton of new citizen cards and building project tiles. It's going to be a lot of fun exploring that new content. Our first game with the new expansion had some very impactful citizens, and the new buildings are just as amusing as the old ones. But perhaps the most important addition is the new artifact market, which enables players to select artifacts from a display instead of blind drawing them. This is a very simple change for something I hadn't really considered a problem, but I really like it. It definitely makes it worthwhile to actually use those buildings after constructing them, instead of just going on to build the next one, which is how my games typically went up to this point. I'm a fan of expansions like this that primarily just add more variety to established components, and the Euphoria one is a great success in my opinion. A lot of people consider Euphoria to be the ugly duckling of the Stonemeyer lineup, but this game is still ranked in the top 400 on BGG, and I quite enjoy it. With the new expansion in hand, it might not get dusty again for a while. Let's see what a contributor brought out of the dust. Caroline Black, username Caroline Black, brought the Uwe Rosenberg in 2013. Mayfair Games hit Caverna out of the dust. She last played it one year and six months ago. She writes, Caverna was one of the first games I bought. I played it several times at three-player count, but it was very sprawling and it never really became a hit with my group. Also, I started playing Agricola online, which seemed to offer more variety and a greater challenge being a tighter game. Fast forward 18 months and I have played 60-odd more different games, including La Havre, Viticulture, Power Grid, and Terraforming Mars. I also started playing games solo occasionally. I got Caverna out and played it solo and really enjoyed it. I seemed better able to determine strategy and combo together buildings and actions. I liked the fact it was more open. I think originally I found it a bit overwhelming with too many choices. I'm going to try an overhang strategy next time I play and then six dwarfs. I'm thinking of taking this to board game club and giving it a go. I guess the advantage that a game like Caverna has is that it does play with more than four. I'm just a bit worried about the time it would take to play, so I'll save it for the bank holiday. Thanks for the contribution, Caroline. You're right to be concerned about time at a high player count of Caverna. I once demoed a full seven player game of Caverna at a local convention that took almost four hours. But the time commitment was worth it. That seven player game of Caverna is one of my most memorable convention experiences. Reaction segment time. I happened upon an interesting discussion on Facebook not too long ago about whether designers should design games about cultures that were not their own. This particular thread pointed out that there was a huge discrepancy in the quantity of games representing African mythologies and the mythologies of ancient Mediterranean cultures and wondered if it was appropriate for non-African designers to tackle this subject. But really, this question encompasses the entire world and it's a concern that always seems to come up when an American Indian themed game is announced, for instance. There were many viewpoints expressed on this issue. Some people thought that any attempt by designers to design games based on other cultures was cultural appropriation. Some people thought that designers should have free reign in this regard. As with most things, I think the common sense approach to this issue lies somewhere in the middle of the extremities. To begin with, I think we can agree that there are some responsibilities a designer must take upon themselves if they go down this road. 
research is a must. And if dealing with a contemporary culture, I think the idea that many people had in the particular thread I was reading of consulting with experts and actual members of the culture during the design process is a worthwhile and common sense suggestion. It's also probably a good idea if a designer doesn't treat a culture they are not a part of in a comical sort of way. That route just leads to disaster and people scratching their heads wondering, what the heck were they thinking? The unfortunate thing that sometimes happens is when a cultural theme is approached with respect and sensitivity, but the designer gets something wrong. Even if they did do research, they may have accidentally used inaccurate information. All too often, the resulting embarrassment and accusations of insensitivity are enough to discourage the designer in question or other designers observing the situation from exploring that road again in the future. I think that would be unfortunate, and I think mob mentality is something we, as gamers, should be careful of participating in. I don't think it's unreasonable to extend forgiveness to well-intentioned designers if they miss something. I think a designer's passion to learn about and share their interest in a culture should be encouraged. Because ultimately, if treated and approached with respect, I think the dangers of cultural appropriation are outweighed by the rewards of cultural appreciation and the opportunities for cultural education and understanding. This week on the What I've Been Playing segment, I'm going to tell you about Bricks, the new roll-and-write game from hot designer Wolfgang Warsch of Ganshan Clever fame. This game was published by Schmidt Spiel in Germany late last year, and just recently brought over by Stronghold Games here in North America. After the huge success Ganshan Clever was for my family, it was an easy choice to pre-order Bricks. I will probably buy any roll-and-write from Wolfgang Warsch from here on out. Bricks is a polyomino style roll-and-write. Coincidentally, there have been... Quite a few of these type of games coming out lately, not the least of which is O.A. Rosenberg's Second Chance and Patchwork Doodle, neither of which I could compare Bricks to at this time because I haven't played either of those yet. Last week I mentioned how Copenhagen felt like the most Tetris-style polyomino game I'd played yet. I'm going to revise that statement already and say that Bricks is now the most Tetris-like game on the market. Here's how it works. A pair of dice are rolled at the beginning of each turn, one colored D6 and one regular D6. Using a coordinate grid system, players find the numbered column and colored row intersection to determine which shape and color of piece is falling. Each player can use a personal bank of energy to change the orientation of the piece. Then they draw that piece on their player sheet using standard Tetris rules, starting from the bottom of the sheet, wide shapes being unable to fall through narrow gaps, and pieces stacking on top of each other when they have the opportunity to do so. If a piece covers a colored circle of the matching color, they get more energy for their bank getting to certain benchmarks in the bank, and completing multiple rows at the same time with a single shape grants players bonus points at the end of the game. When each player can no longer fit a shape legally onto their sheet, the game ends and final scores are tallied. Players score 1, 2, or 5 points for each row with 8, 9, or all 10 squares filled in respectively. Rows higher up on the player sheet also have multipliers of times 2 or times 4. It's an easy game to both learn and teach, yet hits that sweet spot of offering a satisfying challenge because of the unpredictable nature of which shape will fall next. There's a nice press-your-luck element to the game as players must continually weigh whether to use the shapes given them in the most logical space, a space that might grant them more energy, or hold out for the perfect shape to land that will complete several rows all at once. But which might never come. The unpredictable sequence of falling shapes also guarantees each play plays out differently. I've been quite enjoying my plays of this so far. It's become a go-to before bed game for my wife and I. And while we've been trading wins, each game always seems to be reasonably close so that the end result is never certain. Obscure Bryce Game Segment Time. This week on the segment, I'm going to tell you about Banana Split, a 2007 card game from publisher Amigo and designer Mike Fitzgerald of Baseball Highlights and Diamonds fame. Banana Split is a re-implementation of one of my definitive obscure Bryce games, the Pez CCG. Since Banana Split is just as obscure, its 90 total logged plays amongst all players, and its 12-year history is only twice Pez's 45, that makes Banana Split... An obscure re-implementation of an obscure game, an exponentially obscure game in its own right. I've had this game on my wish list for years, but I've never seen it for sale or trade anywhere. And then, out of the blue, a BGG user sent me a reasonable trade proposal for the game, and I pounced on the opportunity. 
Here's how it works. Players try to complete ice cream orders by collecting topping cards and arranging them in a very particular order listed on the various ice cream cards. On a player's turn, they can either draw a topping card or play as many toppings as they can on a single ice cream card. Each of these ice cream cards are worth a certain number of points depending on the quantity and arrangement of topping cards needed to complete it. Once all the ice cream cards are claimed, players tally up their points and the player who has the most is the master ice cream chef. A few special cards and the ability to get free draws each time an ice cream card is completed keeps the outcome uncertain and the game moving at a nice brisk pace. In many ways, Banana Split streamlines the gameplay of Pez by simplifying the turn options. This works fine and makes the game a little more approachable for a younger player set. My five-year-old didn't have much trouble with this at all. But since all the scoring is done at the end, the game does lose some of the tension that Pez possesses. In addition, while the theme change works mechanically, Banana Split does lose some of the thematic charm of Pez. It's hard not to miss the creepy vintage Pez dispenser art. The kids don't care about that, though, so I'll keep Banana Split around to play with them, while I keep Pez around in turn to play with more appreciative adults. Continuing my top 5 favorite table hog games, coming in at number 4 this week is Codan, the 2016 scenario-based miniatures game from publisher Monolith and designed by a bunch of French guys. I usually like to list out all the designers of a game, but there are 7 of them this time, so I'll just direct anyone interested in seeing who exactly they are over to the Games BGG page. Conan is one of my all-time favorite IPs, and it was an easy decision to be part of that Kickstarter campaign when it happened. At the time, it was also my most expensively backed project, even by just getting the King Pledge, which contained the base game, the even more stuffed Kickstarter exclusive box, and a choice add-on character or two. So how is Conan a table hog? Well, to begin with, the main game boards the various scenarios take place on are huge! The player boards aren't too big, but with up to four hero players, the player area adds up, especially with item and spell cards in play. Not to mention, the reference cards are as large as the player boards and just as necessary. As for the villain player, he requires as large an area, consisting of the turn order track and the large river board, which tracks all the various minions and bosses in play. But is all this space necessary? Well, let me justify it like this. Scenario-based games are usually games I avoid. I typically find the setup and extra rules those types of games require tedious and annoying. Conan is one of the very few exceptions I make in this genre for my collection. The huge playing area board actually helps keep setup reasonable. Because each space on the board is so large, it makes it very easy to identify where all the minis should go during setup, and the board never feels cluttered or too crowded during the game itself. The space lets the action of the game breathe and is visually stimulating. One versus all games are just as rare in my collection as scenario-based games. On the rare occasions I play that sort of game, I always hate being the one. But once again, Conan is an exception, and part of that reason is the large river board that the villain player uses. The way the river board tracks what minions are doing what, and the actions they are participating in is both innovative and fun. Once again, the space the game demands not only is necessary, but contributes to the atmosphere and fun of the game. Conan occupies a unique place in my collection, and it's completely fitting that the larger-than-life barbarian needs an expansive space to contain his adventures. Well, that will do it for episode 45. Thanks for listening. Feel free to join the Out of the Dust podcast guild at BoardGameGeek.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Out of the Dust BGG. Leave a comment at the guild. PM me on BGG under user handle Radagast14. Or email me at Radagast14 at CenturyLink.net. And join the Out of the Dust conversation yourself at our monthly geek list at BGG. All right, play me out, Tananda! (laughs) 